Welcome, I hope you're blessed in the Lord. This video I just want to share about uh, a common error that is in the church. It's kind of, it kind of came about during the Protestant Reformation uh, with Luther and others. Um, and it's something that really affects people. It really, on the one hand, it confuses people theologically, but it can go, it can become even something worse that actually leads their life astray to where they don't live in the way of the narrow road that leads to eternal life and ultimately are damned because they uh, believed something false and they followed it followed it through. So the idea that I want to discuss is the idea that faith is, is just, it's just an idea or an accepting of a truth. Uh, it's accepting of truth, a particular truth. The truth being that Jesus died on the cross, he took my place on the cross, and because he died on the cross, all my sins were dealt with on the cross, and if I believe that, then it would be applied to my life and I'll have salvation. This is not completely wrong, but it is not complete. It doesn't have the full picture of what the Bible talks about faith. And so it focuses in only on the atonement. And secondly, it focuses on an idea and a concept instead of focusing in on the Lord Jesus Christ. It's, it's quite comparable to the, uh, the modern word of faith doctrine. Now, if, if you're not familiar with word of faith teaching, basically it says that it kind of goes back to, you know, the movement of metaphysical Christianity, Christian science, and basically says, you don't pay attention to what you see, you don't pay attention to any experience, any physical reality, but you believe. So, for example, if you are sick, you don't claim that you're sick, you, you profess, and by faith you say, I'm not sick, I'm healed. And by saying it, and by believing that, even though it doesn't manifest in your body, then supposedly it's supposed to somehow work out and bring about manifestation in your body. So this is the word of faith that if you believe it, even though there's no evidence for it and you just believe a concept in your mind, then that will change reality. And so it's kind of similar to that. A lot of people will say, look, uh, yeah, my life hasn't changed. I, I, I have never experienced the presence and the power of the Holy Spirit in my life. I've never experienced a change of my will and my nature. I've never received a new heart from God. There's nothing new. But I believe that Jesus died on, my cross, on the cross for my sins. And because I believe that, then I know that I'm forgiven no matter what I feel, no matter what I experience, everything that's already set and done. That is a, a dangerous thing to do because the Bible does not speak only about a conceptual faith, but a faith that is living and active and brings transformation and brings power and brings the kingdom of God into our lives. There's something alive and real in the faith that the Bible talks about. It's not just accepting a concept in our mind. Now, this idea, when taken to the extreme, what it does is this, is if the whole idea of becoming a Christian is, look, you need to believe that Jesus died on the cross for your sins and that your sins are taken away because of what Jesus did. And the moment you believe that, then you are forgiven and you have eternal life. What that does is that makes discipleship, that makes living in obedience to Jesus Christ. The Bible says in Hebrews chapter 5, verse 9, that he's the source of eternal salvation to all who obey him. Um, there's many passages of scripture we can look at that obedience is required for eternal life. doesn't mean that we earn eternal life through obedience, but the, the, road, the narrow road that leads to life is a road of obedience and submission to Jesus Christ. Not perfect submission, not perfect obedience, but it is a, a life. So if we say, okay, when I, when I believe that, then I'm saved. I'm justified. I'm justified once, forever. I'm always going to be justified. Nothing can change this. I'm a child of God, and that's, that's that. Well, then where does discipleship and transformation come in? Well, it becomes something that's optional. So this is where the idea that there can be a, a such thing as a carnal Christian. Somebody can live in rebellion to God all their life, and yet be in right standing with God because they believe the right concept. They believe the right idea and understanding of the atonement and what Jesus did on the cross. So it's a very transactional idea and it's very uh, philosophical, it's very theoretical, and it doesn't bring a transformation. And so it can lead to, you know, this free grace theology that basically says that, yeah, indeed, discipleship and obedience is optional. Whether you obey or whether you don't obey, you'll have eternal life as long as you believe in this concept, as long as you believe in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 3 and 4, as long as you believe Jesus died for your sins according to Scripture, rose again, uh, you know, then you're good. And then whatever you do after, after you, whatever you do after that, okay, that just gotta, that'll just be extras, but it's not something uh, fundamental to salvation. But this is not what salvation is. So we do not, we're not saved by trusting 
that Jesus died for us. So let that sink in. We are not saved by believing the concept that Jesus died on the cross for our sins and he paid for our sins. We are not saved by believing that concept. If somebody tells you that's how you get saved, you believe that Jesus truly died for you on the cross, then that is a false doctrine. It's false teaching. Not that it's false in itself. As Christians, we do believe he died on the cross for our sin. But the idea that that is how you are saved by believing that concept, that is false. That is not the truth of the Bible. Instead, what we believe is we trust, not that Jesus died on the cross for our sins, we trust in Jesus who died on the cross for our sins. It's not by trusting Jesus died on the cross for our sins that we're saved. No, it's by trusting Jesus who died on the cross for our sins that we're saved. That means we're not saved by believing in a concept or trusting it's not. We're believed by or saved by trusting in Jesus Christ himself, by putting our trust, our hope, our confidence in him, not just in something he did, not just in some action or some atonement or some concept, but we trust in him. And when we trust in him, of course, we believe that our sins are forgiven, you know, uh, because he's the one forgiving us. The one that went to the cross is now at the right hand of God and he's the one making intercession for us and he's the one forgiving us of our sins when we come to him. He's able to save to the uttermost all that come to him. So we come to him placing our trust in him. It's not just believing a certain concept about the atonement or a certain idea. And so I, I hope it's clear that there's a distinction between believing a concept about the atonement and trusting in the Lord Jesus Christ risen from the dead. Think about it this way. In, in uh, we see it in uh, Romans chapter 4. We also see it if we go back to believe uh, maybe in Genesis chapter 17. We see that the Bible says that God had Abraham go out and look at the stars of the sky. And when he looked at the scar stars of the sky, God told him, said, your descendants will be as numerous as these stars. If you could count the stars, then you could count your descendants. And it said Abraham believed God and then it was counted to him as righteousness. So he was counted justified. He was counted in right standing with God. He was, uh, you know, in a right place in relationship with God because he believed that there were, he was going to have a lot of kids. No, that's not why he was saved. He wasn't saved because he believed in that concept. He wasn't saved because he believed that, oh yeah, there's a lot of stars in the sky and I'm going to have a lot of descendants. It wasn't that that saved him. It was believing God that saved him, placing his trust in the creator. So why did he believe that what God said was going to take, come to pass? Why did he believe he was going to have many descendants? It was because he believed God. He trusted in the character of God, the ability of God, the goodness of God. And as he placed his trust in God, it says, that, and he believed God, and this was counted to him as righteousness. So we don't just believe the concepts you know, is the concept of the atonement, can believing that save someone? No, believing the concept of the atonement cannot save someone. And sometimes misunderstanding the atonement can't keep them from being saved. In the same way, believing that you're going to have a lot of children because there's a lot of stars in the sky can't save anyone. Believing that concept can't save anyone. But believing it when God says it, because God said it, that's what saves us. Faith in God. Faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. So if we go to Romans chapter 10... Let me look at verse 9. Let's start verse, uh, let's start verse 8. But what does it say? The word is near you and in your mouth and in your heart. This is the word of faith that we preach. So this is the word that is proclaimed. This is the gospel message that brings salvation. That if you confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. So here we have something that we're supposed to believe. We're supposed to believe that Jesus Christ is risen from the dead. If you go through the book of Acts and you look at all the public sermons that were proclaimed or that were written down and the summary of the sermons that were written down by Luke in the book of Acts, you will not find anywhere where they publicly proclaimed that Jesus died for our sins. That didn't make it into the cut. Whenever Luke was making the summary of the, the gospel presentation in the book of Acts, he didn't include that. He, he often mentioned Jesus died, but God raised him from the dead. But it didn't say he died for sins. So why is this? Because the very core message of the gospel is that Jesus is risen from the dead, and that means that now he is now Lord of heaven and earth. He is seated at the right hand of God. So it's important, you know, that we believe that Jesus is risen, and that means that he is now Lord. We're confessing Jesus Christ as Lord. 
So why do we believe that? Why is that so essential? Is it because believing that concept of a resurrected Christ and him seated at the right hand of God is the right concept to believe? Well, yeah, it's a right concept, but the reason we believe it is because that's what God speaks through the gospel message. So when the word of God comes to us, just like it came to Abraham, the, the gospel preached beforehand whenever he was told that he was going to uh, be, uh, that all nations were going to be blessed through him and that he was going to have many descendants and he believed it because he trusted God. So when the gospel message comes to us by the power of the Holy Spirit and we are able to recognize this is from God and I must trust in God, therefore I'm going to believe that Jesus indeed the risen Lord. And so when we confess that he is the risen Lord, we believe in our heart that God raised him from the dead, then we are saved and we are justified. That's why we are, are for with the heart one believes unto righteousness and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. And so the concept that we should believe most more importantly than even believing that Jesus died on the cross for our sins, the more important factor, the, the very central, not to say that not to say that believing that Jesus died for our sins is unimportant, but if we really narrow it down is that Jesus Christ is Lord and he is risen from the dead. He is the risen Lord. If we go back a little bit further, that he is a risen Lord after he died for our sins. And so it's all included in the gospel, but when it really gets narrowed down, we're focused on the fact that Jesus Christ is Lord. That's the message of the gospel. That's why, uh, you know, when we go through scripture and we understand the gospel, it's not so... It's not only focused on us being forgiven and going to heaven because when we do make it that, the focus that we're, you know, believe that Jesus died for our sins so that we can go to heaven, then that's when discipleship becomes an issue. It just becomes optional. It becomes something that some heretical people will say, oh, you don't even need that to have eternal life. You don't need to walk in the narrow road. You don't need to fear God and walk in his commandments. You don't need to abide in Christ by obeying his commandments, John chapter 15, 10. Oh, all that's just optional. That's just discipleship totally separate from uh, experiencing eternal life. No, that's not true. When we come and we place our trust in Jesus Christ, we trust him as Lord. We trust that he is the one that has all authority in heaven and earth. Now, what are the natural consequences of that? Or let me go back and say, what are the natural consequence, consequences of believing that I'm saved and I am definitely going to have eternal life as long as I believe that Jesus died on the cross for my sins? What's the natural consequence? Well, I'll make sure that I believe that. I believe that concept and I will find joy in that concept even. But that won't naturally lead me to obeying him. We could say, well, oh yeah, but that'll cause you to love Jesus and then you obey him. But no, it does. it's not, a, it's not an, a direct line from believing that Jesus died for our sins so that we can go to heaven to that now I'm going to live an obedient life to Jesus Christ. But it is a direct line when we say, I believe that God has risen Jesus Christ from the dead, seated him at the right hand of God, and given him all authority in heaven and on earth. That means that the only way I can have eternal life is as it says in Psalm chapter 2, that I come and I bow down to the feet of the Son of God, that I worship him as the King, him as the Lord. What does it mean that he's the Christ? He's the anointed one. He is the King. And so we come to him as Lord and we believe he is Lord. We confess he is Lord and we are saved through that confession. Now, if we trust in him, if we trust Jesus, he's risen from the dead, he has all authority, and I'm going to place my hope in him, what are we trusting him for? Well, one of the things we trust is his promises. He promises that those that follow him will have eternal life, that if we come after him, we deny ourselves, we take up our cross, and we walk with him, that wherever he is, we will also be. And we trust that he will lead us, he will guide us. So even though we know that we're often tempted in many ways, we have a lot of temptations that come from without and from within, and all this stuff comes up, we know that he is able to save us to the uttermost. We trust all of his promises, all of his goodness that he will provide for us. And in all of this, we trust that because we come to the throne of grace, that he gives us mercy and help in time of need. We can come confidently to that throne of grace because we know that he's merciful and faithful high priest, that he has compassion on us. He pities us as children. And so we come to him. We trust in him. We believe his promises, all the promises in his word. We take them as ours and we rejoice in them and we have peace in them and we delight in them. And we know that, oh, Jesus forgives my sin. Well, how is he able to forgive my sin? Because he's the one that died for me. He gave up his life for me. So I'm trusting not the, my idea about the atonement. I'm trusting that he says he can forgive me. He says that he will forgive me. So I come to him and receive forgiveness. And I understand why he's able to forgive me because he laid his life down to seek and to save the lost. And so I have an understanding and that helps my faith and I trust in him. So again, I'm not saying that we don't have a, uh, understanding that Jesus died on the cross for our sin. We don't 
It doesn't mean that we don't believe that concept. It just means that that is not the believing that concept and having that concept in our mind is not what brings about salvation in our life. Instead, what brings about salvation is placing our trust in the person of Jesus Christ. And what is the main aspect of who he is and where he is and what he's done, that he is the risen Lord seated at the right hand of God. So I come to him and I believe I'm saved because he is a merciful and faithful high priest as I come to him. But I don't only believe that. That's not the, I don't only rejoice that I'm, I've got eternal life and that he's going to lead me all the way to the end uh, because he is the Savior seated at the right hand of God making intercession. But I also believe that he is the Lord. I believe that his commands are the pathway to life. This is why Jesus said in Matthew chapter 7, he who hears my words and puts them into practice is like a wise man who built his house on the rock. When the day of judgment with all its winds and its waves come crashing against the house, it will stand because we built our house on the rock. What is the rock? The words of Jesus Christ, the, the commands of Jesus Christ. He's the, he has the words. They, they said to, uh, Peter said, or, said he, he asked the disciples, do you want to leave also? Because many of his disciples were going away because of that word. And Peter said, where else can we go? Because we believe that you have the words of eternal life. And so it's his word that is life. It's his word that is truth. His word sanctifies us. We need to cling to his word. John, Jesus said in John chapter 15, 10, that we abide in him by obeying his commandments. So when we believe that Jesus Christ is Lord, then we will trust in him as Lord and we will trust that his words mean something. So when we come to the commands of scripture, we won't count them as optional. We'll say, this is what the Lord God his, and his son say. This is what Jesus Christ, the Lord of heaven and earth, says. And we will take that seriously and we will walk in it. There's no way I can say I'm depending on, clinging to, trusting in Jesus, and yet I walk in rebellion to him. This is why James makes it very clear that faith without works is dead. If you say you have faith, you have this concept in your mind, but you don't have works, then it's dead faith and it can save no one. Because a living faith in a living person will then cling to that person, including obeying his commandments and holding close to him. When we fall and fail in, in obeying his commandments, then we come to that throne of grace because we find a merciful and faithful high priest. And we keep coming to him because we have the hope of eternal life because he's our savior, but we, have, we submit ourselves because we know that he is the Lord with all authority. But not only that, we also tremble at his warnings. If I trust in God, if I trust in Jesus Christ, I will trust in all of his words. That means I'll rejoice in his promises, I will submit to his commands, and I will tremble at his warnings. So when he warns that those that hear his word and do not put them into practice are going to be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand, and on the day of judgment, the winds and the waves are going to crash against that house, and great is going to be the fall of it. If he warns and says, why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do not do what I say, and then says, many are going to say, Lord, Lord, but are not going to enter the kingdom of God because they do not do the will of my Father in heaven. Oh, and what was the will of the Father in heaven? The commands of Jesus Christ, the words of Jesus Christ. He spoke the words of the Father that lead to eternal life. So when he warns me, I will tremble at his word because I trust that he is the judge. He is the Lord, he is the Savior, and he is the judge. And because I trust in him and who he is, then I'll find joy in his, his being a mediator for me. I will find submission as I see that he is Lord of my life. And I will find trembling as I hear the warnings of scripture so that I do not go astray and do not walk according to the flesh and perish, but that I walk according to the spirit and by the spirit put sin to death that I might live. Let me go ahead and close by looking at faith in uh, a passage of faith here in Hebrews chapter 11 because like I said the main error that I'm trying to address is this this idea that that faith is just an idea it's just a concept in our mind that we believe a certain idea about the atonement and as long as we believe that idea about the atonement then we're good but you've got to recognize that throughout the United States throughout even here where I'm at in East Indonesia there are people if I could say in my neighborhood I could say in my neighborhood probably 70% believe that Jesus died on the cross for their sins. But that doesn't mean that they're all Christians just because they believe that. Because do they believe that he's Lord? And they say, well, yeah, I believe that he's Lord. Well, if, why do you call him Lord, Lord, and do not do what he says? You don't believe he's Lord if you don't submit to him as Lord. There's no way to say that you do. So we need to understand that it's not just that concept. But here, the biblical model of faith is quite different. 
Now, faith is the substance, substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Verse 1. For by it, the men of old obtained a good report. So faith is trusting in God, trusting in him that he's going to bring something about. We, we have faith. We're looking towards the future. We're looking. We have a confident expectation. And by it, the old, people of old obtained a good report. So let's look at some examples of how this faith worked. By faith, we understand that the universe was framed by the word of God so that things that are seen were not made out of things which are visible. We come to the word of God and because we trust and believe in God, we gain understanding. Those in the world that follow the, the wisdom of men and the foolishness of men, they say that we evolved from apes, they, we were once reptiles and then eventually came into something else and believe in this lie of evolution. But we have understanding because we trust in God, we're able to go to his word, read his word, that God created the heavens and the earth and that God made man both male and female in his image. We're able to read that, we're able to understand it, and so by faith, trusting in God, we gain understanding. Okay, verse 4. By faith, Abel offered to God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain offered. Through this, he was approved as righteous with God testifying concerning his gifts. He still speaks through his faith, though he is dead. So in his trust in God, he looked to God. He said, God, what offering do you want me to give? He, with an obedient and submissive heart, he brought that offering and that offering then showed his righteousness. And it says that he was approved as righteous as he brought that. So his faith in God led him to walk in the right way and give the right offering, the offering that was pleasing to God. And in fact, the, the fact that he was giving it in faith was what was pleasing to God. But it's not faith in that he had a concept of, oh, I believe that if I give this offering that it's going to somehow make a transaction. No, he was bringing it to God whom he had faith in. Verse 5, by faith Enoch was taken to heaven so that he would not see death. Now, this means there's a result of faith. There's a consequence. Something happens whenever we trust in God. So by faith, Enoch was taken to heaven so that he would not see death. He was not found because he, God took him away. For before he was taken, he had this commendation that he pleased God. <coughs> so faith, when we trust in God, that means we're connected with God. That means something is going to come from God. There's going to be a work in our life. There's going to be a work and a consequence in our life that uh, that that uh, God works through that faith. As we cling to Him, then He works in us. Just like He is the branch, or, or He is the vine, and we are the branches. As we cling to Him, then His life, His divine life, and all the uh, the powers of godliness flow into us, so that we can live holy and godly lives. So He pleased God. How did He please God? Verse six. And without faith, it is impossible to please God, for he who comes to God must believe that He exists and that He is the rewarder of those who diligently seek Him. So, what is faith? Well, first of all, it means coming to God, not just coming to concepts and believing them in our mind, but we come to God. He who comes to God must believe that he exists. So the first thing we have to believe is that he exists. A lot of people believe that God exists, but do they believe also that he is the rewarder of those that diligently seek him? So faith is something, it, it moves us. It moves us to come to God. We believe he exists, we come to him, and we seek to live lives that are pleasing to him because we know that he rewards those that diligently seek him. If we believe that God rewards those that diligently seek him, and contrary-wise, that God punishes those that ignore and reject him, if we believe that, what will we, will, what will we do? We will come to God. We will live lives that are pleasing because we will walk by faith, trusting in the Son of God, submitting to him as Lord, trembling in his word, rejoicing in his promises. We will do what uh, Enoch did. We will walk with God in a pleasing way, knowing that he rewards those that diligently seek him. How did Enoch get rewarded? He was rewarded with eternal life. You say, well, that's earning salvation. No, it's not earning it. It's meeting the conditions that God gives us, that we must walk with his son. We must abide in his son. In Jesus Christ is eternal life. Apart from Jesus Christ, there is no life. So if we depart from him, if we say, well, I believe the concept he died for my sins, but we live in rebellion to him, he will come on that day and say, I never knew you. I reject you. You are not mine. And so we need to walk as Enoch walked. We need to walk trusting that God is there and that he's the rewarder of those that diligently seek him and so we come to him verse 7 by faith ne by faith noah being divinely warned about things not yet seen moved with godly fear prepared an ark to save his family by which he condemned the world and became an heir of the righteousness that comes by faith by faith what did he do he trembled 
He heard the warning of God that there was going to be, that God was going to flood the earth. He believed it. He trembled at it. He believed it because God spoke it. And he trusted in God and his character and his ability to bring it to pass and his, that his character was going to do what he said he was going to do. So he trembled and he built the ark. And this is what saved him. He was moved by faith. So faith moves us to action. This is the kind of faith that saves, not the kind of faith that has a right theological concept and believes it and accepts it in our mind. That is not biblical faith. Okay? It's true that biblical faith includes right concepts and having them in our mind, but that is not the whole of it. So the error is when we make that what saving faith is, when actual saving faith is a relationship with God. One more here at verse 8. By faith Abraham obeyed when he was called to go out into a place which he would later receive as an inheritance. He went out not knowing where he was going. By faith he dwelt in the promised land as in a foreign land, dwelling in tents with Isaac and Jacob, the heirs of the same promise. For he was looking for a city which had foundations whose builder and maker is God. By faith Abraham obeyed. By faith Abraham obeyed. And so we see that the faith that is saving faith is a faith that moves us to obedience because we believe in God. We believe that Jesus is Lord. And if he's Lord, then we're going to submit to him. We're going to obey him. Now we could look elsewhere. If you look over in James, let's go ahead and jump over there. In James, let's see. James chapter two, verse 14. What does it profit it, my brothers, if a man says he has faith but has no works? Can faith save him? That is, can faith without work save him? If a brother or sister is, la la is naked and lacking food, and one of you says to him, Depart in peace, be warmed and filled, and yet you give him nothing that the body needs, what does it profit? So faith by itself, has no, if it has no works, is dead. So what's the analogy? He's making an analogy. He says, look, if there's somebody that's naked and without food, and you give a hearty approval, and you say, I bless you. I, I, I pray that you be warmed and well-fed, but you don't give him anything. Your words mean nothing. They're not going to accomplish anything. It's not going to put clothes on them. It's not going to give them food and fill their bellies. It's not going to do anything. And so in the same way, if you have a faith that doesn't have works, if you don't have action with your faith, that kind of faith is just dead. It's not a saving faith. Verse 18, but a man may say, you have faith and I have works. Show me your faith without your works and I will show you my faith by my works. And so faith is manifest. This is why on the last day we're going to be judged according to our works. The Bible does not say we're going to be judged according to our faith. It says in the New Testament over and over, we're going to be judged according to our works. Why? Because our faith can be seen. It, it, it produces action because it's trusting in a person. It's trusting in the living God and in his son. And we're submitted to him, believing he is Lord. We're rejoicing in him. We're walking in him, trembling at his word. So we need to understand this is a relational word. You believe that there is one God. You do well. The demons also believe and tremble. But do you not want to be shown, O foolish men, that faith without works is dead? Was not Abraham our father justified by works when he offered his son Isaac on the altar? Whoa, that's pretty hardcore. He's saying he's justified by works. Do you see how faith worked with his works? And by works, faith was made perfect? In other words, faith is made complete. Paul says it this way in Galatians chapter 5, verse 6. Faith working through love. So faith, when we're trusting in God, we're trusting in Jesus Christ, then we believe that he is Lord. We believe he's Savior. We believe that he is the judge. This moves us to action. If it doesn't move us to action, we don't believe it. We just simply do not believe it. And so this concept that faith is just indeed a concept, that we just believe this concept, have it in our mind, this is a dangerous concept. On the one hand, it will lead us to question, well, do I really have to obey? I mean, is it required that I obey God? Or is that just an extra kind of a extra spiritual blessing if I, if I do that? Because we'll think, well, I'm already forgiven and that's my goal, so there it is. But the gospel goal is not just that we be forgiven and go to heaven. The gospel goal is that Jesus Christ is Lord seated at the right hand of God. That's the gospel. That's the good news. God has placed his son as the king of all heaven and earth. That is the good news. So that is that good news for everybody? It's good news for everybody. Even for those that end up in hell, that is good news because God is reigning on the in the world and over all creation through his son. This is good news. This is the gospel. So that's the gospel that we believe. Now, if we 
if we submit to him, trust in him, turn to him and walk with him, well, then there's a, a, an added benefit that we're going to share eternal life with him. But those that reject him and deny him, it's still good news that God's son is on the throne. And so we need to understand what we're believing in. We're believing in the gospel. So it's not just a concept. Biblical faith is not just a concept. And anybody that boils it down to that, you know, such men will boil it down to these little concepts and then they will have this little idea of God, this little idea of salvation. Everything is just about you dying and going to heaven. Uh, there's, there's one man, I, I'm just amazed. Uh, it's a, a man named Greg Jackson. He's a, a so-called free grace teacher. I'm amazed as I watch his channel. He can post things. He posts things almost daily. And it's always the same topic. He thinks it's the gospel, but it's not the gospel. He thinks it's because he's always just telling everybody they're, they're, they're you know, lost and not saved if they don't believe only in the free grace theology. You know, it's only focused on having this right concept in your mind. You have to understand this, and if you understand this right, then you're saved. If you don't, then you're not. All these kind of things, and it's over and over and over again. And so what it's done is, is all biblical truth, all the wonderful gospel of the glorious Son of God that is risen as Lord, seated at the right hand of God, that he's going to destroy the earth and create a new, uh, that he's going to raise us from the dead, that, you know, that he's going to cast, uh, you know, his enemies into the lake of fire, that he's going to crush all the kingdoms of this world. All of that is summed up in, if you believe this right thing about 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 3 and 4, then you'll have eternal life if you believe it the way that I say to believe it. And that's it. Boom. Okay, oh yeah, oh yeah, well there's added discipleship if you want to go that route. There's, you know, this and we can talk about raptures and all other kind of stuff. But he's able to speak day after day after day. And because it's such a simple concept, many people are able to find verses that line up with, yeah, we need to believe and trust in Jesus Christ. He died on the cross for our sins. They're able to find those verses and then they fall into this trap not because it's true, not because it's biblical even, just because it's easy to grasp in one mind. And so whatever difficulties they face in their life, now, for example, they, you know, they face condemnation up. Oh, you don't have to be con condemned. Just have this word of faith idea, you know, that uh, even though I'm still living in rebellion, I'm actually still a new creature. Uh, yes, I live in daily rebellion. I'm addicted to pornography, addicted to drugs. I'm, I, I'm addicted to all kinds of wickedness. And I do these things daily and habitually. Uh, but it's okay. I believe but I'm righteous because I believe that Jesus died on the cross for my sin. He paid for my debt. And that's once for all transaction already done. That's like a, a man going around. It's like, it's like somebody that's been falling into the word of faith movement and you go up to them and they're obviously sick. They look miserable. They've got a deep cough. You can tell that they've got a fever. They're sweating. You got all this and you say, oh, brother, are you sick? And they say, no, I'm healed. I'm healed. By, the, by, by his stripes, I'm healed. It's like, brother, you're not healed. You're sick. You know, look at yourself. You're sick. And so these men come to the scripture and they come to the gospel and they make it, boil it down to this little uh, concept, this little theory. And they try to have men place their hope in this theory instead of placing their hope in the risen son of God. Instead of placing their hope in a person, the Lord Jesus Christ who's been given all authority in heaven and earth, they place their, their, their hope and their, all, their, all their desires are placed in this one little concept. Believe this right thing and you're saved. If not, you're out. This is dangerous because they're walking around still bound in sin, still in such bondage. Now, that's a dangerous thing. You're either a new creation or you're not. Old things have passed away or they're not. You can't, you, you, you can't say that, oh, I, you know, I've, I've been changed by God, but I'm not yet changed. No, it doesn't mean that we're transformed in the moment of time to perfection. No, but we're changed from glory to glory into the image of Jesus Christ by the power of the Holy Spirit. As we walk in the Holy Spirit and we put sin to death day by day, you know, the Christian life is this. As we're walking, we, we're, we're like struggling with stuff. We're fighting against. We know this is our temptation. This is our weakness. And by the, we're praying, Lord, help me. Help me to overcome this. He gives us power. We overcome that issue. Just when we're about to overcome something, then the Holy Spirit comes to teach us and renew our mind more and show us other attitudes, other mindsets, other issues that are in our life that need to be worked on and transformed now. And so this is the life of walking with God. It's a, a relationship that he's continuing to peel off the layers 
of our sinfulness, of our motivations, of our attitudes. He deal, takes them off, and then we, by the Spirit of God, we fight the good fight of faith, and we fight against those things, and we submit to God in those areas. And nobody can ever become self-righteous in this because by the time you get victory in one area, God shows you three other areas that you need to deal with. And so it's not about perfection, but it is about transformation. And the idea that we can come and just, oh, because we believe this concept, no matter what happens after that, I believe Jesus died for, on the cross for my sins, and so because of that I'm once saved forever no matter what happens I become an atheist I become a, a, a Mormon I become a you know a Muslim I become whatever but I'm still saved because I believe that at one time that transaction can't be taken away this is false my friend and this idea the it, it starts with the concept that faith is only a concept in our mind and we need to get away from that now a lot of people that are uh, in the church they they have that idea but they try to balance it out. This is, the, this is the real benefit of those in the Calvinist camp, is that they have this uh, idea that they want to keep both truths of Scripture. And so what they do is they have this, this idea that as long as I believe Jesus died as a sacrifice for my sin, I believe that, then I receive assurance of forgiveness of sins. Okay, I'm, I'm justified. I'm justified once for all the transactions have been made. But then they say, they go ahead and said, okay, yeah, but then God will supernaturally and deterministically work into our lives to make sure that we then bear fruit and we walk all the way to the end with saving faith and a holy life. Okay, so they're, they're doing their best to kind of work that false concept that was brought in by the Reformation. Now, when I say false concept brought by the Reformation, I'm not appealing to the truth of Catholicism because there were a lot more things that needed to be dealt with there. But whenever this idea, this concept that Luther and others brought in, that they're only supposed to have this concept, believe Jesus died, and then you're forgiven, that's it. Having that concept doesn't really fit with all of Scripture, and so that's why our Calvinistic brethren have gone the route of saying, oh yeah, but then God has to work these other things in us by his grace, otherwise we wouldn't be full and biblical Christians. And so I hope this has been helpful to you, just sharing some thoughts, things that are going on in my mind and things I'm thinking about that are very important, that we understand the biblical teaching of faith, that it's a living hope in a living person, that we're trusting in him, trembling at his word, rejoicing in his promises, believing everything he says. If you don't believe what, what God says in his word in Galatians chapter 5, that those that walk according to the flesh will die, will perish, that he who sows to the flesh will reap corruption. If you don't believe that, you do not trust in God. You are not placing your trust in God if you don't believe in all that he says. Whether he tells you that your descendants are going to be as numerous as the stars of the sky, or whether he comes with the gospel and says a dead man, a dead Jewish man has been risen from the dead, is now Lord of heaven and earth. If you don't believe what he says and all that he says in his word, then you do not have faith in him. Because faith means trusting in him. And then when we come to his words, his promises, his warnings, his commands, we will take them at face value and we will walk in them. I hope this has been helpful to you. God bless.